Hi, I'm Samir Yaakov. The title of this presentation is Deciphering the Gate Charge Curve of Power MOSFET. Let me start off talking a little bit about the parasitic capacitances that we have in a power MOSFET. Here is the drawing, we have the gate, drain, and source, and we have capacitances inside the device itself between gate between any two terminals, as a matter of fact, between gate and drain to be CGD, gate and source, and drain and source CDS. Now, manufacturers are giving us parameters that are actually measured, and uh, one of them will be C sub ISS, which is the capacitance seen uh, at the input, the gate between the source, when the drain is connected to the source. This is the SS, these two are connected together. And then we have the C out SS, which is between the drain and the source, where the gate is again connected to the source. So this is the SS. And then we have also information about the CGD, CGD between gate and drain, which is a very important capacitance has a lot of effect on the operation during the switching of the transistor. And this is uh, defined at CRSS. These capacitances are highly nonlinear. Here is a typical curve that uh, you'll find in data sheets of a power MOSFET. Here we have the drain to source voltage. This is the capacitance. This is pico uh, farad. So this is the 1000 a picofarad, which is one nanofarad, this is 10 nanofarad. And we see that there is quite a bit of a change. Now this is the log-log scale. CRSS starts with about eight nanofarad at the very beginning, but this is the very first volts here. And then when we come to 25 and higher than that, um, we see a drop and CRSS, for example, drops quite a bit. In fact, since this is a log-log scale, this is a 650 volt device. So most of the operating range is here. So this is actually the capacitance. This is just for the very beginning, but it has some effect that I'll talk about it later on. Now, there's also a table in the data sheet that gives these parameters, CISS, CLSS, etc. But this is one point, this is like, this point here, uh, 25 volt, these values here. And let's see, see out SS here, it's like eight uh, nanofarad. And indeed, uh, see out SS, it's about 8.7 uh, nanofarad, 8,700 8, picofarad. So this is also given in the data sheet. Another piece of information that I like to go over, which is very important to the discussion later on, is this GM curve of the transistor. This is uh, the relationship between the drain current and the G V sub GF, that is the gate to source voltage, this is the input voltage to the device. Now these are three curves are for different temperature. Let's just talk about the 25, which is this one. And we see that said to get the 50, amp uh, for this device, you need something like 6.25 volt. Well, it's not only temperature dependent, these curves are also voltage dependent. So again, it's, there's a family of curves here, but uh, let's just concentrate on the sort of behavior of this curve, which is important for the discussion later on. So the thing that I'm going to do now is to look at the turn on process to see what happens as we feed the pulse to the gate of a transistor via a resistor. This is a, a boost converter. Uh, we have an inductor, diode, output section, output filter, capacitor, and then this represents the load. This is a power MOSFET turning on and off by these pulses. And what we are going to talk about is the effect of these capacitances, CGD and CGS, as we feed this pulse. So we are talking about the process that we've been at zero input voltage, and then the pulse went up to a certain value, let's say it's VG. So here it is when this pulse is sustained. And we are now going to look at the charge that we have to supply these capacitors 
in order to bring the gate to VG level, because at the, at, before the pulse, this point here, the uh, gate point was at zero, at ground level, zero volts, and we have to bring it up. So it turns out that despite the fact that the MOSFET is a, well, a MOS, it's a metal oxide, so there is actually insulation here uh, between the gate and the channel, uh, then during the pulse, you do have to deliver quite a bit of current in order to uh, bring up this voltage to the level that you need uh, to turn on the transistor. So we start off with zero volt here, and then it goes up to VG. Now this capacitor, let's start with CGD, before the pulse had on this side here, zero volt, and on this side, the output voltage. The reason is that while the transistor was off, the current was passing through the diode. Uh, so this voltage here was clamped, the, the drain is clamped to the output voltage. So here we see approximately V out. So this is the voltage across CGD. While after this transistor is on and this voltage goes down to ground, the short is so to speak, except for RDS on, of course. Uh, this point here will be zero volt, while this point will be now already VG. So this is the new situation. Now, if you do the same thing for CGS, here it is. At the very beginning, we have zero, zero, because it's zero here, zero here, and then it goes to uh, the gate, the input voltage, VG, and then zero. So now we can sum, sum up all these charges that are needed to uh, charge or discharge these capacitors. Let's start with the CGS, which is simple. Uh, it, it has no voltage across it, and then it came to be VG. So the total charge required is VG over CGS. Now, what about CGD? Well, it's more complicated. We have two uh, steps here. One is we had zero here, excuse me, zero here and output here. So first of all, we had to sort of discharge, you might say, this capacitor to the zero level. And the amount of charge required would be V out times CGD, which is this one here. And then we have to charge it the other direction to VG. So we have this component of charge. Summing all these up, we see that the total gate charge that we need is VGS times CGS. This is this original capacitance here plus CGD, this capacitor, times this factor. So one thing we already can say is that the charge now is not dependent on CGD, but on a larger value. V out of a VG could be large because V out could be something like, I don't know, 400 volts, 600 volts. And this ratio could be a large number. So there is an effect of increase increase in the capacitance, the effective capacitance that we see. This is very similar to what we call Miller effect in an amplifier, which in a negative feedback amplifier, in which we will have a capacitor between the output and the input. We'll see it in a minute. So this is why this effect is referred to as Miller effect. In fact, you can look at this as a gain factor, because what happens here, while the gate here changed from zero to VG, this is the range, the amplitude here, the drain change was from V out to zero. So you might say that this ratio is sort of the gain, the effective gain that you had during this switching process, which is very similar to the Miller effect. So let's have a look at the inner action that is going on. We have the boost, we have these capacitances. Now I'm going to represent the inductor as a current source because during the pulse, the change in the current is small and I'm assuming small ripple now, just for simplicity. And therefore, this is like a constant current source. This diode is the clamping to uh, actually it should be V out. I'm sorry, this should be V out here. So this does, really doesn't matter for the discussion here. And then we have the transistor. Now, as we have seen, the current of the transistor is a function of this GM. This is the um, 
slope here of this curve, ID as a function of VGS. And um, also, I haven't pointed it out, we have here a threshold that the current actually starts at this given level, so 4.5. So I'm sort of subtracting this value, just an approximation uh, for the behavior of this MOSFET in terms of the current as a function of the gate. That's not an exact expression, but for our purpose, that's good enough. Sort of linearizing it around a certain point. And then we have this CGD, which is connected between the drain and the gate. This is CGS, and here's the input section. So we can say that this is actually an amplifier. This is the input, this is the output. Here, this is the input, this is the output. And there is this capacitance here between the output and the input. And this is why uh, we call this a Miller effect. And this would be at the point of the, I'll call it the linear range. What does it mean? As we feed the gate of this transistor with a pulse, the current will start building up. Nothing will happen actually in terms of the clamping until this current actually reaches the current of the inductor. Only then we'll start to see a drop in this voltage and the diode will stop conducting. And I'm not talking now about reverse recovery and, and effect like this. I'm just concentrating on the main issue of the switching of the transistor. So I'm now here in a position which is just in between, that is the transistor just reached the value of IN. And so we have here sort of a floating point here. This is equal to this. And so this is high impedance. A rather small change in the current of the transistor will sweep this thing very fast. But wait a minute, there is a problem here. And the problem is that do we have this feedback? Now, the currents that we have are actually the IL, the transistor current, I mean, the, let's call it the channel current here, and the gate current, which goes this way. So strictly speaking, the transistor is actually seeing two currents, this one and this one. Now, there is a delicate balance here because if the transistor current will increase a lot, this voltage will drop. It will sort of sweep it down. If it will drop, then the current will again decrease, will become smaller. So this is in fact a feedback effect. So what is happening here is that you might say that this current source and this current source are sort of frozen. They are not changing. There is a current which is passing this way, excuse me, this way. Okay, we are talking about the on state. Now, the gate voltage is constant because it is linked to the drain or the channel current by this equation. And as we have already just seen, the current will not change. So this is kept constant. This is kept constant. There is a current. And this capacitor is being charged or discharged any way you want to look at it. If this voltage is constant and the current goes this way, the voltage starts dropping. So it's very interesting that the drop of the drain voltage is not due to this current. Sometimes it looks like that, but it's not. It's due to the charging of this capacitor. This capacitor is controlling the voltage here. These two are equal. The current this way is equal. G is constant, I mean, VGS, I mean, this, this voltage. And current is flowing here, and the voltage is dropping and dropping and dropping. So there is a period here that the VGS is kept constant while the drain is dropping and the current of the transistor is, is in fact fixed. 
It's very interesting. And here we see a picture that actually tells us the same thing. This is a very typical, that's a very important uh, curve that shows the VGS, the voltage of the gate, as a function of the charge. We charge the total charge that goes into the transistor. This is this plus this, okay? This plus this. And as we have seen earlier, the charge here is much larger because of this uh, Miller effect uh, process. So what we see here is the following. As the pulse just came in, the current starts flowing in. Charge starts to accumulate at these capacitors. Here it is, this current charge at these capacitors. And the voltage starts rising. Nothing happens until we reach the threshold. This threshold that I've just talked about, here it is. This is about, say, this threshold here. And once we reach this threshold, then current will start flowing here. Nothing happens in terms of the voltage here because it is still clamped. It is lower than IL. So nothing happens. And the current goes up and up. And the charge is fed, is increasing. This is charge. Until we reach the point that the current of this branch is equal to IL and the voltage here separates from this V out clamping starts going down. So here we are at the very delicate balance point in which these two currents are equal. The gate voltage is kept VGS kept constant. Here it is. The voltage here drops down linearly because of the charge of this CGD, not because of the current, because of this voltage change. And once this voltage hits zero, that's the end of it. And we see again two passive capacitors. That is, there's no action or there's no Miller effect because there's no gain anymore. It's already clamped now to ground. So this slope here, the beginning, is indeed CGS plus CGD. This is these two capacitor before the transistor start to conduct. And then here we have the flat region. And then again, when this voltage here is already connected to ground, we see again two capacitor in parallel, and that is this region here. So this is the explanation of this uh, curve, which is again very important because it tells us how much current we have to feed to the gate to get to the completion of the switching. In this case, we are talking about the turn on. So this is the amount of, current, of charge that we need. Now in the flat region, these two are again the same. The current goes inside. This current is the inductor current plus the gate current. We are at this current here. This will be the VGS that will be maintained at this point. This is this VGS. And then the charging of the capacitor is causing this voltage to drop. Here it is dropping linear. So it turns out that this level here, VGS here, is a function of the current. That is, if your operating point is different, that is, if the inductor current is higher, say, you would need a higher VGS to maintain it. So therefore, this curve will be much higher here. So this is not a universal curve. This is for one operating point. And this operating point, I'm now referring to the current. So this is why it's pointed out here that this is for 60M. And 60M, 60 amp is what 6. Point, uh, I don't know uh, 8 say and this is about what we have here that's a small difference but it's very close so the height here this height is a function of the current of the inductor operating point 
Now, let's have a look now what happens during the process. We started with zero volt here, then we had the pulse and we have a voltage here of VG starting to charge these capacitor. They are charged here. Nothing happens in terms of the current because we have not reached the threshold. Once we hit the threshold, the current starts building up. This is the current through the transistor. Still, the, out, the drain voltage is clamped to the output. So this is the drain voltage until we reach the inductor current. At this time, that's it. We have this delicate situation in which the transistor current is equal to the inductor current, and we have this drop of the drain. This is this region here. So we have now a range here in which the drain voltage was high, the current was rising, the product of which is power. So there is a, an amount of energy that now is dissipated and actually heating up the transistor in this region. And the amount of energy is the length of time here times current times voltage over two. So this is the, it's over two because when you, the, the product here is also a triangle. This is a straight, I mean, this is a fixed height and this is a triangle. So uh, this is the, the reason for the two. And this is this energy here. But then it goes on because here the current is constant, but the voltage is still maintained, although it's going down. So it's another triangle for the length time of T2. And this product again brings up another energy loss. And the total energy loss will be this T1 plus T2 times um, the uh, V out over IL. So this will be a switching loss when the transistor is turned on. I'm concentrating in this video on the turn on process. I'll talk a little bit about the turn off, but the turn off is just the reverse, uh, just going back in time uh, of the uh, turn on process. Now the question is time. I mean, how do we get the information about time? We're talking here about charge. Well, the time is linked to the current because the higher the current, faster will this Q will build up and the shorter will be the time. So the current here is VG minus VGS over RG. I'm talking about now about this region here where this is VG. This is correct all the time, but uh, let's talk about this particular instant. And then I is delta Q over delta, delta V. So therefore the duration of the time is delta Q over I. And uh, depending on the I, in, in the case of, of this plateau, the I, the IG, that is this current is constant, as we have seen. Here it's uh, changing, increasing, and here it's constant. Now, this equation implies that you actually you can convert this into time by dividing these value by the current of the gate. So for example, if uh, you are maintaining a one amp, that is VG minus VGS over RG is one amp, then divide this by one, this will become nanoseconds, okay? So it would mean that it will take, um, I don't know, say 80 to 140, that is 60 nanoseconds to go over this range. Now, here it's a little bit more complicated with current is changing. So here we can actually take an average here. We can take an average these two values and take an average and uh, find the average current uh, from which we can find the uh, time that will take for this, and then we can find out the total time that is required. In general terms, we understand that we are talking about uh, this time. So it's like for one amp, it'll be like 200 or something nanosecond uh, for this switching instant, from which we can get the um, losses for the two parts of this uh, turn on process. This part in which the ID is going up, and this part that the VD is going down. Now, this is energy we talked about to get the 
power, you multiply it by the switching frequency. This would mean that the higher the, the switching frequency, the higher will be the power losses. This is a real limitation uh, because uh, if you have high energy loss during the switching time, then you are limited with the uh, switching frequency. You can um, go up. And also, let's just uh, remind ourselves, we are not including here losses due to the reverse recovery of the diode. And I'm not talking about also the output capacitor, which also adds something to the story. Let's talk about it a little bit later. So we have seen that VGS is a function of the current. That is, this height is a function of the current, of the inductor current. What about this length here? Well, it is a function of the output voltage, because if the output voltage is higher than CGD, charge is larger and you need more charge to sort of replenish it and so this curve this original curve is for say 325 volt output here and if the voltage will be higher say 600 volt this might be something like that so this is something to take into account and important is the time is a function of the, the current so the higher the current um, the faster of course this process will continue so now I'm going into something which is kind of very intriguing, uh, very interesting, and uh, I haven't seen a analysis of this uh, effect. And also I'm not giving here all the aspects of this uh, effect, of this uh, phenomenon, uh, just a hint of really what's going on uh, to understand better sort of an intuitive understanding of the processes that go during the switching. So my question here that I'm posing and I'll try to answer is the following. Do we understand that the, the transistor has an output capacitor? C out as I We also understand, sort of we feel it, that as the transistor is turned on, this energy is dumped into the transistor. So this is an extra loss. There's no question about it. But the question is, where do we see this effect? That is, if we measure the voltage, the current here, and the voltage here, we see some waveform, and from them we can calculate the power loss of the transistor. Because if we know the current, okay, current here and the voltage of the transistor will give us the power loss of the transistor. Now suppose you have two cases. You have one case with C out. SS and one without. So you measure here the current and you measure again the voltage. What difference would you see because of that? You have to see a difference because obviously this power which is dissipated and get lost comes from the input. Well, that's conservation of energy. If power here is transferred to heat, then this power has to come from here. So where do we see it and how does it affect these waveforms so as to provide this extra power for this loss? So here we have a charging, excuse me, here we have a discharging of this capacitor, while during the off time, of course, when the transistor is uh, off, then, we'll have a charging of this capacitor, okay? So this capacitor is charged here and discharged here. Obviously, energy gets lost and we lose energy here, goes to heat, and somehow this has to come from the input and the question is, what is the effect of this on the waveforms here that would supply this extra power? So the experiment, or the mental experiment I'm going to do is the following. I'm looking at two cases. One in which there is no output capacitor, and one in which there is an output capacitor. And I'm talking about the turn on process. So we are at the turn on, and I'm looking at the current of the transistor. 
And then I have again turn on and I'm looking at the current of this transistor with this uh, capacitor at the output. Now obviously the current here is lower than the current here. Why? Because the current here is affected by this current and this current. Well, and you have to subtract actually to add this current. So the transistor is absorbing all these currents. Now, the difference between this case and this case is that we have now an extra current. So the current of the channel is higher. If it is higher, then VGS has to be at a larger voltage. If VGS is the larger voltage, the gate current is smaller, lower. Therefore, it'll take longer time for this process to end. So by having a higher current, a higher VGS, we are suppressing the gate current and the gate current is, as we have seen before, is the key for a fast um, switching. So here we see it in the GM curve. Without the extra capacitor, we were at this current of the channel. With the capacitor, we are here. Now, obviously, VGS here is larger, and therefore, the input current is lower. Very interesting. Now, there is another point here that I like to explain, which is also something that, in fact, I sort of found it out myself only recently, and that's the following. I've been always under the impression that when you have this output capacitor and you sort of turn on the transistor, you have sort of a spike, like a high current going in and discharging here. Because you are turning on a switch on a capacitor and that's what you'd expect. Well, it turns out that this is not so. Because we understand now that this voltage goes down linearly because of it is controlled by this CGD. If it go too fast, this voltage will change and it will correct it, the feedback system. Now, if this voltage goes down linearly, capacitor sees a linear voltage. This is the state space equation of a capacitor. The current is C times dV dt. So, the VDT is constant. This means that this capacitor, assuming a linear capacitor now, of course, because if it's non-linear, then you have to take non-linear effect. So the VDT is constant. So therefore, the current is constant. So we have a situation here, which is really very interesting. IL is constant. The voltage goes in a constant slope here. The current through this capacitor is constant. Of course, this current is constant. Therefore, this current is, co is constant. So everything is sort of frozen while this voltage is sort of going down, down linearly until it hits the ground level. So since the voltage here is higher than the voltage here, because the current here is larger than the current here. Therefore, the gate current, again, is lower, and therefore it'll take longer time. So this process of uh, going through this plateau, through this uh, uh, charge in the Miller region, uh, this process takes longer, and therefore the losses will be longer, and that is why we are going to have more energy actually is coming in into this process. So from outside, we'll see more energy pumped in in order to um, replenish, in fact, this uh, turn off process. So what is happening again is that this voltage going down and this time, this time will be longer because we have a lower gate current. Now, what happens at turns off? It turn off, we have a situation in which with a capacitor, some of the current is going through this capacitor. So therefore the current here is smaller than 
without the capacitor. If this current is smaller, then VGS here is smaller. But notice here, this point is ground now. We are at the off position. So current is going this way, and the magnitude of the current is VGS over RS, RG. Excuse me. So therefore, when VGS is smaller, due to the fact that this current is smaller, the gate current is again lower. So in this case, also we have a lower gate current. So in both cases, we can see that the waveforms here, the timing will be different as such as to accommodate this extra power that has to come from the input uh, to the transistor due to this uh, extra power dissipation. Now I'm showing here only some aspect of this COSS. There are some more intriguing um, results here and implication, which hopefully I'll uh, show in uh, another video. We should remember that everything that has been said is sort of assuming a, a, a linear capacitor. We have not taken into account that the Capacitors are highly nonlinear, which will have an effect on the waveform, on the timing, etc. But as a first approximation, and just for understanding the phenomena that we are talking about, uh, this is pretty good using a linear capacitor. Let me show you, though, what happens if the nonlinear capacitor is really affecting the process to a large extent. This is some data from a power MOSFET by on semi. Uh, this is a 2M 500 volt P channel. Well, it turns out that this phenomenon is sort of pronounced in the P channel. And what we see here is the following. We see again the charge curve. This is again charge, and this is VGS. And they're showing here also VDS. This is the voltage of the drain to source starting with uh, here, the, this is the scale here. So this is 250 volt and it's going down uh, to zero. And lo and behold, it's different from what we said. We, in the analysis, found that the drop stop when at the end of the Miller effect that is here. So this is this should have been the line. While here we see it sort of dropping earlier than expected. So that we have here a portion of Miller effect in which the, the apparently the VDS is already down. This is completely different with what we have seen before. Now what's the reason for that? So we would expect it to be a curve like this, while it's only like this. But if you look here carefully, it really doesn't go down to zero. There's a certain voltage here. So what really we are seeing here is the non-linear effect of CRSS, which here in this transistor is changing a lot. Now here, this is CRSS. Notice that this is 25 volt. We are talking about 250 volt. So um, uh, this would go on becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. So for a large portion of the swing, the capacitance is very small. Only at the very end, when the VDS is already small, the capacitance is very large. By here, they are sort of drawing it in the other direction, sort of, an, you might say it's an expanded scale. Here it's from zero to uh, 25, when VGS is zero, and here it's VDS is zero, so the other way, either direction, from zero to 10 volt, just to, it's like an expanded scale. So we see that the, here it's 500 picofarad, while here it's very small. It's very small. So as we approach the very low voltage, 
The capacitor CGD, this is CGD, is becoming very large. So now with the same gate current, the drop of the voltage is much, much slower. This slope here is a function of the value of CGS and the current charging it or discharging it, you might say. Here, the, the capacitor is very small. So therefore, this is a fast changing slope. Here, it's smaller. So we see here that <clears throat> the nonlinearity of this capacitor is really affecting very much the behavior. And therefore, the losses here are different. Since the drain is almost zero here, the contribution here is very small. And therefore, uh, you have a much lower switching losses. So we see that in this case, this nonlinearity is really sort of helping out in that the voltage is already very low while the current is again already high, but uh, it's, it's a smaller area here uh, than the case where the capacitor would have been a constant capacitor, a fixed capacitor, not a nonlinear capacitor like this. So clearly there is a lot more to the parasitic capacitances that uh, meets the eye. It's, it, it's a complex situation, especially if you start talking about the nonlinearity of the capacitance. But I hope that this um, video or this presentation give a, gives a sort of an intuitive understanding of the process. And I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have found this presentation interesting and that it will be helpful to you in the future. Thank you very much.